All right, welcome everyone to uh, episode 15. That's how long we've been doing this weekly with episode 15 here. With uh, we have with us um, Kai uh, De Gomez, who is uh, a certified public accountant CPA and has been doing that in town for how long? Maybe 15, 16 years. I'll pull it up for you a little bit, actually. Like we always say, I'm a better mortgage banker than podcaster. All right, give so 15, 16 years. Yeah, 15, 16 years. And you went, didn't you do like a stint? Doesn't you know, like everyone does? Like you go down, you work for this big crazy firm before you you know get your cut your teeth a little bit, and then uh, yeah, I did my time at KPMG. It's one of the big four accounting firms. Did a year there in Phoenix. And, okay. Uh, yeah, you're just a little ant, uh, but they work you to the bone <laughs> and. They plan on you leaving, and yeah. uh, so I did that and came up here and have loved it ever since. And you were you're born and raised in Flagstaff too, right? Moved or, here or, when or, I was 10. It? Moved here when you were 10, okay. So so I've been here a long time. Spent spent a couple years away, but most of it's been Flagstaff. So Right so. on. And and your business now is focused um, just basically on, a, on your own book of business, right, of dealing with Personal tax returns, but more so probably more in, in the business, corporate kind of strategies, advisement, and tax returns, right? Yeah, exactly. So being in a small town, we have to do everything. Um, yeah. But I try to specialize in um, business returns, typically real estate professionals and um, medical professionals. Um, okay. So probably about two-thirds to three-quarters of my, of my time is spent doing that. And then the other quarter is just everything. So. Okay. Love it. I love it. And there's so many things like, you know, I talking <laughs> or just texting you beforehand of like, we're not just going to like pull out the book and start talking about tax code. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause we know like there's boring parts of my job and boring parts of your job, but let's talk about the, ex- the exciting stuff, right? What's sexy in tax code. Right. And mm-hmm. there's some interesting things I think like, oh, and even just thinking about, I get asked all the time and just because things change and cause you're the expert, I defer always to, talk to your CPA, talk to Kai. Um, and I was thinking, man, just even if it came out of this, there's so many little clips to be able to send people on all these different questions that people have. Um, but maybe starting big in general, you and I have talked about before that at least current tax code really seems to favor people that buy and invest in real estate. Um, when whether that's, the, you know, that's, I don't know. I, I guess I should let you talk there on it is is, is that still the case? And why do you think that is? Oh, yeah. I know it definitely is. When I remembered I had your podcast and I was like, man, if we're going to talk about basic taxes or changes for 2022, yeah. they're all downers. It's like <laughs> oh, we, had, we had all these changes for COVID that they, so you had increased child tax credit, dependent care credit, better charitable, more things. Those all expired. So oh, as of yeah. 20, 2022, we're back to the old stuff. So it's like people are going to pay a little more. So the the when you said, oh, we're going to talk about real estate, I'm like, okay, that's great. Because <laughs> real estate is still, there's still great benefits to be real estate investors. Um, when we look at stuff that's in the news, um, I don't I don't like to get political or anything, sure. but you, you see these, you hear, how does Donald Trump not pay income taxes for I can't remember. Seventy five percent of his of the years they looked at his tax returns, he didn't pay any any taxes. I have real estate investors that are in similar situations where they they cash flow a lot of money every year, but their tax liability is is really low. And that's because of um there's a few um, big benefits in the tax code for real estate investors. You know, the first one is is depreciation. So when we look at um, any any real estate, typically we always buy real estate because it's going to increase in value. Um, that's the number one name of the game. If you can get your property c- to cash flow, even break even, <coughs> you're making money because typically you're paying down your loan and then your property is going up in value. But for tax purposes, we get to say that that property is r- decreasing in value. So, um, so that's that's going to save you taxes there. Um, and, and so that's, that's one of the great benefits of real estate. The other benefit it's, um, that, that we don't really hear a, a lot about um, that a lot of real estate investors take advantage of is debt. Um, so a lot of times 
um, we get in a situation, if you're a stock investor and you have a, a great stock that you like, that you've had for years, you've made a lot of money on it, and you want to diversify, you need to sell that stock. Um, and that's going to create tax liability. Um, on the real estate side, you might have that same situation where you have a, a real estate um, property that's increased in value. Um, you've made a lot of money off it, or um, maybe you haven't paid a lot of taxes in it. Uh, maybe it's doubled in value. Well, um, you can either, you could refinance and take that equity out and buy another property, and that's all non-taxable. Um, or you could do a 1031 exchange where you sell the property, buy another property, and not pay any tax. So but with those those strategies, instead of being um, where I bought Apple 10 years ago, and now I want to do something else, and I have to sell it and pay taxes. On the real estate side, well, let's just borrow against it and buy more real estate. Or let's sell it and do a 1031 exchange and buy different properties. And between the, the depreciation and then borrowing against refinancing your properties and buying more, you can you can go years without paying tax, significant taxes on your real estate. And that is just a great benefit that a lot of people don't realize. Yeah, it's um, that's why I always love talking to people that are smarter than me. And whenever I sit down with you and then understand all these different, like I get really, really excited about real estate on the front side of things, right? In the sense of like, hey, buying an investment, seeing a check uh, come in for rent um, is exciting. But then knowing like if anyone sit down, you know, it's, it's this time of year is when we're talking to Kai here and you sit down and you look at your W-2 and you see that, wow, you know, you know, regardless of the income bracket that you find yourself in, the the federal government takes their fair share. And, and I don't care to get into like ethical conversations of like, should people be paying more taxes or should they just pay to what the law requires? Right. And yeah, we're, ultimately, if you are not educating yourself on the system and working your best within it to maximize your best for yourself and your community. I don't know. That's going to be my standpoint on that one, right? And, and to where, but yeah, again, I get really excited on the front end. But to hear all the different things to say, hey, here are ways that you can utilize this tool to create uh, and generate net worth and wealth and cash flow. But that it allows you to minimize tax burden. It's pretty awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. A lot of times when I do a tax return or I, I invest in real estate too, um, I look at the end of the year and I do everything I can to reduce the income. And, and I was at first I have that feeling. I'm like, why, why isn't there more income coming off this? And then I, 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 I have to step back and say, okay, if I add back my depreciation, the improvements that I wrote off, um, things like that, I have great cash flow and it shows income but I, I want my tax return to show a loss. And so, um, so it's, it's fantastic because you are, you are generating income. You are, your property is increasing in value over time. So your net worth is going up, up, um, significantly through, through these investments. But when you look at my tax return, I'm losing money on my real estate. And so it's, it's a great deal. And, and so it, 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 it's just one of those ways that, um, even gives you more cash flow to invest more in real estate. And so, and there's some win-wins there for like, even this last year. Um, <laughs> if you ever really want to know a black light will help you really know <laughs> how bad that, uh, the carpet in a townhome is, is cat <laughs> piss saturated. I don't know if I can say piss on a podcast, but mm -hmm. I just did. Um, and so, yeah, we had a, we had some tenants, had a cat they shouldn't have had. Um, we get a, someone to blacklight and see how bad is this. And it was bad. <laughs> I think they said like 70% urine saturated oh, carpet. That's bad. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, you know, and we, with the timing of everything, actually the new tenants were already in there and they were there when he blacklit it. And I was like, well, you know, I'm not going to try and sell one on anything. I'm like, ah, you know, it's not a hundred, <laughs> but you know, so there we are. 
you know, I'm in a position where I want to improve the property. I, you know, for, for you know, health, safety, and just for the, the you know, livability for these these tenants that are paying good money and Flagstaff rents here. And uh, but I'm incentivized to do that, right? Mm-hmm. Of saying, hey, yeah, it's I'm not making money <laughs> in expenses, but it gives me some incentive to say, hey, I want to keep you know the slumlord mentality um, can only you know it's a it, it's it's not the big picture game, right? Of keeping the properties up, improving the properties that you have incentives to do that, and so that's that's cool as well. Yeah, no, exactly. Whenever I look at real estate, I always think of cash flow. Um, and that's what you're, when a lot of times um, when my wife has gone in and look at properties, she looks and is like, oh, I'd like to change this and change that. And I'm like, honey, we're buying cash flow. And so <laughs> so we, like, yeah. like when you say carpet, luxury vinyl flooring, that's what we have in everything. So it. we don't ever have to mess with that. Yeah. But we put it in, it looks great. And it lasts forever, and then you don't have that the cats or dogs or yep. um, problems. Yep, um, that's in there now. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, yeah. so hopefully you don't have to deal with that in the future. But when I, when I look at it, we always want our properties to be in great shape because that's going to give us the best cash flow. Yeah. But then when we um, make those improvements to those properties, we take advantage of the tax code and we write those off to every extent we can. And so. Um, it's just a great, um, a, a great strategy. The other strategy that I know we've talked about before is, is the cost segregation studies. Yeah, that one was big. Yeah, and so that's where you can um, talk to a, a professional. There's online services that do it too where um, you put in the specifics of your property and it allows you to dep- depreciate your property faster. So a lot, <coughs> excuse me. So it allows you to break out different components of the of your property, say your cabinets or your flooring, your driveway, landscaping, and instead of depreciating those over 27 and a half years or 39 years um, for um, commercial properties, we can depreciate them over five or seven or 15. And so those are, it's just a great tool that you can use to reduce your taxes. Absolutely. Well, and let's, and uh, we, we kind of jumped right into it, but maybe for some big disclaimers of like, we, we realize everyone's situation is very unique. Call Kai, right? There's, there's the, there's the legal disclaimer on, we're going to talk about some things, but it doesn't mean that all things work or are applicable to you here. Um, and, so, but, but with that being said, I wanted to, um, again, everyone, I am a mortgage debt professional, not a tax professional. So I'm going to ask a lot of questions that hopefully people have um, on these types of things to where, if someone is saying, okay, awesome, I have all this depreciation or I can accelerate this depreciation. Um, but if someone is, you know, working and playing that, that loss game where essentially they keep in, you know, reinvesting in the property, they got expense, depreciation, so they're really not showing income and they're not taxed on that income. Um, does that offset other incomes that they may be receiving? Other W-2 income, interest or dividend income, self-employment income how does that work when is there any real estate carryover loss so it depends on the individual's um, situation Um, so typically um, real estate income or loss is considered passive income so typically passive income will not offset your ordinary income your self-employment income your w-2 income if you actively participate in that rental where you're the manager you're doing the repairs, overseeing that. If you make under a hundred thousand dollars, um, or, or, or under 150, um, there's, there's a possibility you can deduct some of those expenses. If you're over 150, typically those expenses are going to get suspended. Um, and so, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, because a lot of times when we look at other investments, um, that, that generate income, we're paying taxes on that every year. So sometimes um, in a situation where if you purchase a new property, um, you do a cost segregation study, build up a a loss, you'll have that loss and it might carry over for five or 10 years. So the next five to 10 years, there'll be no um, tax liability. Um, You might say generate a $50,000 loss the first year. Well, if you have five to $10,000 worth of income for the next five to 10 years, um, that it's going to be five to 10 years before, before you use that all up. Um, and the strategy I like is if you can buy a property every two to five years, 
well, then you can build up a loss and then you use that and then get another one and build up. And so you can go uh, multiple years um, without paying any any tax when you do have positive cash flow from the properties. Gotcha. Yeah. So so basically, you don't lose depreciation. Mm-hmm. Um, you just tip, you know, depending on income bracket, typically have to keep it within the real estate world. So one property's losses can offset another property's gains year to yep. year. And then you're carrying that over to then, you know, offset additional years. So just playing that strategy. I yeah, summarize that correctly. exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so those, the other, the income from one property can be offset from the loss from the other. And so, yeah, I know it's, you can play that game where, um, where over time you can build up those losses, use them through, and then um, buy another property and generate some losses. And, and so it's, it's a great deal because um, like I was saying, if, you know, in five years, if this property doubled in value, you can pull out that equity, buy another property. Um, and so, so it's one of those things, at least me personally, I don't look to, um, to make monthly cash flow off, off real estate right now. It's a, you have this growth time and then over time you can build up your portfolio. Um, then by the time of retirement, you have, a lot of properties that are paid off and are great cash flow. So, and then the idea with that as well, um, just generally speaking, is that you're then at a time of retirement, or as you phase out income, your your W two income or <clears throat> or self employment income, or basically, um, if people aren't just solely, because I'd say <clears throat> it's probably more often than not that you have people that the the and real estate is a, I guess I should be careful in generalizations, but real estate can be most of the time like a side hustle, mm-hmm. right? A majority of people have a side hustle. There are certainly people that it's the main gig, um, but with a lot of people having it as the side hustle saying, okay, your main gig is now dropping down. Your tax liability there is dropping down. So all of a sudden now you hopefully are in a different tax bracket and then start showing, you know, you're, you're getting that real estate income. Is that yeah, and yeah, exactly. the The idea is, is, um, yeah, most real estate investors are. It's going to be their side hustle. Their, um, you know, typically their plan is to build up these assets um, while they're working at another job, and then once they hit retirement age, um, they have these properties that are going to generate a great income, and 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 hopefully everybody's diversified. You know, there's, you don't want to be a hundred percent in real estate. Um, or 100% in the stock market or, you know, it, everybody's mix is whatever they're comfortable with. Sure. But real estate um, is just, they're just great assets in retirement too. And that's what's, that's what's great about real estate is you can grow um, as you purchase your properties and pay them down. You can pay little to no tax. And then once you hit um, your retirement age um, and start, pulling money out of them, they're great assets for retirement too. A lot of times um, for, for the stock market, we, we hear that um, you can only pull out three and a half, four percent of your, of your real est- of your stock portfolio a year to be able to re- um, have money 20 to 30 years out. Um, in those, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in those analysis that show um, those, three and a half, four percent withdrawal rates. Typically, once you hit 30 years, your your portfolio is going to be down to nothing or or, or, or it could be um, pretty minimal. With real estate, typically, we can pull out five to seven percent um, of the value of the real estate and cash flow. And th- that real estate continues to grow over time. So, so when I look at real estate in retirement, if I put in a hundred thousand dollars in some real estate, I would expect to get maybe six thousand dollars a year from that every year, and typically rents increase with inflation, so that's indexed to inflation, and then over time the real estate increases in value too. So if it only increases two percent a year, in thirty in thirty years I might that real estate might be worth two or three hundred thousand dollars that was originally a hundred, where in our stock portfolio we have that hundred thousand dollars we can take three and a half to four percent out of it and then in 20 to 30 years most likely it's going to be down to zero 
um, most of those, um, when they do those analysis, they, they, they have that withdrawal rate and they say, okay, if you have a 4% withdrawal rate in 30 years, you have a 95% chance that you will still have money in the account. And so, but there's still a 5% chance you have nothing. Um, and so in these real estate models, when you take out 6%, you're just taking out cash flow. You're not pulling away from the principal. So, yeah. so, I mean, when you look at real estate, it's, it's just fantastic. It's, it's work. It's work. It's work no, going over to, your... it's going over the tenants and <laughs> dealing with the cat piss. But, uh, yeah. but it, it, yeah. it, you know, that's our life that we got to fight the IRS and now they're 87,000 new agents, uh, <laughs> with mm-hmm. their, with their guns. <laughs> we won't go into all that, <laughs> um, uh, to where, uh, um, uh, it's you know the, you said they categorize it as passive income. I was like, no, I try and I try and tell everyone that, and the, um, is that hey, that's a bit of a misnomer, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's not you know, a full well, depending on your portfolio and what you're doing in short term and long term. Like it doesn't necessarily have to be a full time gig, but passive is 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 not a good definition of it. Yeah. Um. But that's and that's where I think one. So again, a couple other rapid fire questions here, um, just because I know a lot of people. Uh, they, they don't think about the tax piece to it. And this last round, like last year, last couple of years, right? I had have CPAs calling me saying, hey, you, you're missing, we're missing a, um, oh, the uh, 1098, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we're missing the reported interest because there's got to be more interest on this. Uh-huh. And I t- like, you know, and sometimes as mortgages get sold and things, maybe there was a 1098 missing. So sometimes they're right, but but probably more often than not, CPAs were calling and I was doing the math for them and saying like, um, at a two and a half percent rate, that is all the interest, sir, like or ma'am, you know, like that's it. Um, and so that's that's you know, uh, and we won't go into all the you know itemized, not itemized, and interest. Well, I guess that plays into people knowing if you hit a certain. Um, tax bracket and you you have the ability to itemize based on you know, charitable contributions all these different things so if you're itemizing and then you utilizing that interest deduction that that the interest deduction alone didn't really help you out a whole lot if you refinance in the last two years and you're really having to have like pretty hefty large debt at a two and a half percent rate to even have that help you itemize right oh yeah yeah no it's i remember back in the day 10 years ago you would see mortgage interest you would just expect here in Flagstaff with high um, property values, you'd expect to see twenty to thirty, forty thousand dollars in mortgage interest. And now with these super low rates, yeah. I mean, sometimes you see people with eight thousand dollars in mortgage interest and you're like, Where's your other ten ninety eight? Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then you do the math and you're like, Nope, this is it. So yeah. so the one thing that um, so that's on your personal on your personal home itemizing. Yes. So, because the one thing we want to point out when you, when you have a rental, there's no threshold to where um, I'm either going to itemize or take a standard deduction. We're always going to take your, your actual expenses. That's what you're going to deduct. So a hundred percent of that mortgage interest on a rental is going to be deductible. Awesome. So, and then, so on though, on the, um, Right now, and, and you're just probably, I know you just said the season's just barely kicking off, especially right now with all the snowstorms. No one's no one's going out there to say, I want to brave the storm and do my taxes. Like that's said no one ever, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, but so do you anticipate that a lot more people will be itemizing given the higher rate environment and that there's actually a net benefit to people? You know, the silver lining of higher silver rates, lining. right? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, definitely with, with the higher standard deduction, there are less people um, itemizing their deductions. But yeah, if you're buying a house today in Flagstaff and you're getting a five or $600,000 mortgage at 6%, I, uh, I mean, I think you're going to be, um, you know, that just that interest alone and your property taxes are probably going to bump you over the threshold. So there is going to be a benefit to the, the additional mortgage, um, a a tax benefit to the additional mortgage. Absolutely. And probably speaking of this, and anyone actually really watching and paying attention on this is to where I'll probably put a link um, that you and I, I can run some analysis with you and put a link to see how people understand the actual expense and more so on like on investments because investments are quite a bit more expensive and they changed, uh, you know, uh, the powers of B, Fannie and Freddie uh, changed the second home regulation as well, um, which, okay, so that's, let's talk about that though. I know I just stepped in it. Um, second home, if it's a true second home, 
good luck. You're not getting any deductions, right? No, you can still deduct a second. You can still deduct a second home okay. mortgage on a second home. Um, there, there's there. Um, we used to have a one million or a one point one million dollar total mortgage interest deduction. Now that's down to seven fifty. So, um, you know, if you have a more a two three hundred thousand dollar mortgages, one's a first, one's a second home. You're you're good. And so, um, just with that reduced amount and housing prices now sometimes the second home gets phased out and is, isn't fully deductible gotcha how does that sit with someone's doing because it's it's very very frequent for our area is that that airbnb model right of hey we're using a little bit we're getting up there skiing playing in the summer but we do have some rental income on it um how do, does that work so how that works is is you look at the days the the amount of days you use the property so if you're in a situation where you used it 20 days during that year and then you rented it out 80 days during the year, so there's a total days, 100 days, um, it would turn out to be 80% business, 20% personal. So we'd go down all of your expenses, 80% of them would be offset, would offset the rental income you have. The remaining 20% on your property tax and your mortgage would go over as itemized deductions. The remaining like the utilities on the 20% for personal use, that'd just be non-deductible. Gotcha. Yeah, pretty logical on that one. And with, um, so one thing I know we have happening right now is um, there's a couple of things that come to mind, but let's start one by one here. A lot of people are doing equity lines, mm-hmm. right? Because um, we don't want to touch that first mortgage that's sub three or something yeah. or in the low threes. And so, but they, they still want to either purchase new investment properties or um, let's actually go with that strategy because that'll give us more. But well, well, there's both, right? They will either want to improve prop, uh, improve their own property or do whatever they want with their own equity or using it to acquire more properties. How does that impact, like, what's deductible on on that equity line, whether it's then for their personal uses or then if they use that to be that down payment on an investment property? Yeah, so this has got a little more complicated. In the past, you had $100,000 on an equity line that you could take and you could do it do whatever you wanted with it, and it was deductible. Once you got over the 100000 then we had to look and see what what you used the money for. That's no longer the law. Now, if you take an equity line on your property and you want to improve your property, it's it's deductible. If um, if you don't use that equity line to improve your that property, it's no longer deductible as an itemized deduction. Now, we got to look and, and see what what the what it was used for. So if you use that equity line to buy a car or a boat, non-deductible. If you use that equity line for an investment property, now it would qualify as investment interest um, or mortgage interest on that investment property. So, oh, yeah, sorry. So even though it would be secured on, say, like a primary residence, you would be able to um, tax-wise line it up with the investment property and 100%? Yep. Yeah. It's so if you so say if you took half a mil, ha, half a million dollars, yeah. and you use that to to buy an investment property, you would you would need to keep really good records to show. Um, the IRS calls it interest tracing rules. So you'd yeah. need to be able to trace that money. So if you took five hundred thousand out, and that goes directly to the title company, or yep, it goes into yep, a yep. bank account, and then you write a check the next day for five hundred grand for that investment property. Yep, we can trace that. And now all of a sudden that would would qualify as uh, as an interest expense on the on the rental. I want to point out though, if for the second homes, I get this all the time. Yeah. And second homes are a pitfall on this. Uh, okay. So oh, we yeah. have the situation where someone's like, Oh, I'm gonna take out a hundred thousand equity line and I'm put the down payment on my second home. Um, in between all the mortgages, I'm under 750, so everything should be deductible, and that is definitely not the case. Ooh. So with the second home, the debt has to be secured by the, the second home. So typically when you're going to do that, that equity line on the first, on the first home, that, that debt's going to be on the first home. It's going to be for the second home. You can't mix and match on those, okay. and so that's that's a that's a big pitfall because I see that. Or people even be in a situation where, yeah, they only have fifty or hundred thousand, and they take three or four hundred thousand on that equity line, buy the house, and they're like, oh, once interest rates go down, we'll 
we'll refi it or whatever. And sure. it sounds great. And I'm like, but none of that's deductible. So if it works for investment property, doesn't work for second homes. Gotcha. So, but if someone were, again, equity lines are very popular right now, so we don't touch the first mortgage, but we're pretty optimistic that rates will reduce to some level at some point in time. So if we get back into the cash out refinance business, and so they do a cash out refinance to pull $100,000 out to buy the second home, is that all then deductible? Nope. So, nope. So the cash out refi, so because the money is coming from the first and the debt is secured on the, on the original yeah. home it's not deductible on the second home because this because um when we look at at our primary residence and second home mortgage interest deductible the laws on that is the interest has to be secured the the, yeah. lower, the mortgage has to be secured by that house but yeah so if they just have a higher mortgage on the first can they all count that as primary deduction nope so it's just that so so that that second is it, um, for it to be an itemized deduction, it has to be secured um, by that house and used to purchase or improve that house. Gotcha. So that's where you have house one and house two. So if you get an, an equity line on house one to buy house two, it was used to purchase house two. Sure, sure. So that makes But sense. it needs to yeah. be secured yeah. by house two. So okay. if you could get a lender, I don't know if you guys could do it, but if you could get the lender to put security on the first house and house number two, we're good. But if, but yeah, if the mortgage is secured, <laughs> and it's one of those things, whenever I talk yeah, to the lenders, work. it's just out of the box, so it can't happen. But uh, it's, yeah. but typically, you know, it has to be secured. The ha- sure. If the loan was used to purchase house two, even it if it's part to, of the first mortgage. Yeah, even if it's part of the first. So you actually to. have to then do the math on a 1098 when someone says, hey, I owe 300 now I owe 400 and I refinanced and did this, then you'd have to say, hey, we got to actually do hand calculate the 1098. Yep. Wow. Okay. Crazy. So let's then let, let talk other scenarios. A lot of folks are um, thinking of, you know, they're, they're we're, everyone's always – not everyone, sorry, let me get to my thought here, is that uh, move up is always something that happens in the market. And it's created some issues with people because they're moving up from uh, like crazy low interest rates to these other uh, higher rates. And so there's a lot of thoughts on, you know, what do I sell? When do I sell? Do I um, convert to an investment property? So let's maybe talk about a couple nuances there and a common, common question, or maybe the, the most commonly asked question in that scenario is the capital gains. Mm-hmm. At this point in time, capital gains as far as that's concerned how does that work for someone thinking hey i'm going to sell a primary residence or do i convert to investment and then consider selling it how does that work okay so um first off we need to go into what is your gain because a lot of times when i talk to people they're always telling me at close i'm getting two hundred thousand dollars or at close i'm getting x and that's not your gain your gain is how much you paid for the property minus how much you're selling it for. And so, or um, the flip side, how much you're selling it, sold it for, minus the, the, your original cost. Now, if you made improvements to the property, those type of things, your closing costs, those all can reduce your gain. So once we've figured out our gain, then we need to look and say, hey, was this house, was it my primary residence for two of the last five years? So if it was my primary residence for two of the last five years, I get to exclude $250,000 worth of gain. If I'm married, I get $500,000. So say you have someone who's lived in a house for 15 years, they they make $600,000 gain on this. If they're married, that first $500,000 is non-taxable. They'd end up paying tax on $100,000. So depending on their tax rate, um, the tax, the long-term capital gains rate can be 0, 15, 20, or 23.8 for federal purposes and two and a half for, uh, and two and a half at least this year for, for Arizona. So um, tax rates really vary based on your, your income tax bracket. Gotcha. So if they did convert, so some folks thinking, hey, let's, you know, and they're thinking, do we, do we try the investment route or do we um, just have it as a primary? It sounds like there's about a three year buffer. Yeah, yeah. So, right. so I have people that get in that situation where they're like, well, I'm going to rent it out for two years, then I'm going to sell it, and I'm still going to be two of the last five years. And so that definitely works. So um, in that situation, if this, these, these people 
they decide to rent out the house for two years. Um, and then after two years, they sell it, make that same $600,000 gain. We'd still be in the same, that same situation where the first 500 would be excluded. Now, if in that two years that they rented it out, the property was going to be depreciated. So there's going to be a little bit of depreciation recapture that, that'll adjust that gain. It, it shouldn't be, um, real significant, but, but that's the, the key is you don't want to miss that, that you don't want to rent it for three years, three, three years in a day. Cause yeah, all of a sudden you just yeah. lost your $500,000 exclusion. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. Well, and then, uh, and now is when they sell and they're out of capital gains, there's still a tax liability that it's reported as income, right? Whatever they make is reported as income and they just pay in their like normal tax bracket or how does that work? I've never sold the property. Okay. I'm like the never, <laughs> yeah, I'm no. the never sell guy. Yeah. I, I, I own the property, but I have never sold. Yeah, no, I've, I sold one house and I, I regret it. I wish I knew. <laughs> I, I, there's one, one house I sold. I, I yeah. shouldn't have sold it, but um, I'm there with you. So what'll happen? So in this situation where we have someone, they, they made 600,000. Yeah. Um, they were married. So they, they, so we show 600,000, but then we show, you don't pay tax on that's 500. Not, and that's the total, that, that's assuming they got $600,000 gain. Gain, yeah. So, so that, that'd be like, yeah. we paid, we sold it for, for 800,000 and we paid 200, which in Flagstaff, if you bought a house 15 years ago, I mean, that's not unheard of at all. The math that's, is sound. That's, yeah. So, <laughs> so if we're there where we, we bought for 200, sold for 800, got a $600,000 gain, we don't pay tax on the first 500. So then there's a hundred thousand left over. That hundred will be um, will be taxed at the capital gain rates, but it depends on what income tax brackets you're in. If you're in the twenty two percent, to if you're above twenty two percent, you're going to pay fifteen. If you're above, um, um, if you get into the the higher tax brackets, you might get bumped up into the twenty percent tax bracket, which hits at four hundred or four fifty. If you're um, married or, or, or filing joint. And then, um, above 250, you'll, you'll get another 3.8% for the, um, net investment tax that pays for Obamacare. Gotcha. So yeah, so on that, that 500 sheltered, you pay zero income tax. Zero. There's no tax on that. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So it, so it's, so if you're in that situation where you paid 200 and you sell it for 700 and there's that $500,000 gain, there's zero tax on that. So it's, that's a good deal. Yeah, which then for a lot of folks knowing that you're not going to be penalized to move up or move out. And that's, that's a pretty generous, I mean, again, what is 250 individual and then 500,000 married? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's not necessarily a bad gig. And I think that that's, I, those timelines, it's also important for people to know as they're trying to make those decision points. And then as far as converting to the investment, um, it's just a matter of them reporting day one, hey, we, we moved up in June we now started, here's the lease, or here's what we started doing in June, and then that's where you work to then start depreciating property like at that time, right? Yep. Yeah, exactly. So, so, and that's one thing. Um, there is um, everything being equal, interest rates being equal, everything. There is an advantage in that situation where if you're like, oh, I'd, I have this property, I paid 200000 for it, it's worth seven. Um, and I'm going to convert it to, to a rental property, and I want to rent it for the next 20 years. There is an advantage to selling it um, tax-wise because if you convert that to an investment property, your cost basis is 200000 So if you decided, hey, I'm going to sell this for seven hundred, and now I'm going to buy a $700,000 house, um, you have a $500,000 gain, you pay tax on zero, and then the new house has a $700,000 cost basis. So now all of a sudden where you have that 700,000. Um, so, so everything being equal, mortgage rates being equal, you are going to lose out on, on some closing costs, you know, if you use a re- realtor. Um, but, but when you think $500,000 paying tax on 500, um, you know, even at 20%, that's, that's a hundred grand. So, so there, so there could be a, a benefit to selling and buying a similar property. Yeah. Well, and, and that's a couple of things come to mind when you say that is like, yeah, no, three, three years in a day or five years or 10 years, you, you got to probably like, I don't know, everyone's changes and their situation changes, but really to say, if you are not going to sell, 
that you better be holding on till you retire. Is that a pretty fair assumption? Yeah. The, the, For optimal type yeah. strategy. Life happens, opportunities change, get it. But yeah, if you're if you have an inkling that you just might get tired of the property or you moved town or state or something and you really think, Am I gonna be back here in four? Like you better have some serious conversations with yourself in two and a half years after you move. Yeah, exactly. So the uh, the tax strategy, I don't know if you've heard of this. They say the best tax real estate tax strategy is buy, refi, and die. And so, because you, you I never, never I heard that one. I love it. You never want, you never uh, want to sell because you get a tattoo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah, you never, yeah. you never want to sell. Um, yeah. So the idea is you have this property. It's, you pay down, you pay it down. It's got great cash flow, And you're like, hi, I want to sell it and buy, buy two properties. And it's yeah. like, no, let's just refinance it pull some money out, buy that new property. So now we got two properties and we have two things that are being depreciated. Well, once we hit 27 and a half years, your depreciation's gone. Um, and so if you're like, oh, I'm not, now I'm going to sell it. Well, now you're going to pay more tax. So you're like, no, let's refi it again and buy some more real estate. Um, and then, um, and then you just have that forever. It's a great asset in retirement because it's just paying you this cash flow. You're paying tax on it now. Yeah. You're paying tax on all that money. But then when you die, your heirs get the property. And what happens is under today's tax code, um, that property gets stepped up to fair market value. So say you have this house you paid 200000 for, and when you when you die, it's worth a million dollars. Well, Welcome to Flagstaff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so you could be, you know, oh, I'm going to give this to my kids, you know, a couple years before I die. No, that's the worst possible thing you can do. <laughs> Cause then they get this property you've depreciated. And so yeah. in, you're like, no, I paid 200,000 on the books. It might be worth 50,000 cause we don't get to depreciate land. So maybe the land value is 50,000. So it's on the books for 50. If you go and sell it, you're going to pay tax on 950,000. If you die, which if you love like really paying out money to, to our current, government and to let them spend it however they want if you really love that then that is the strategy you should go yeah for. yeah you should sell it <laughs> quick disclaimer yeah, yeah sell it now if you want to give your money to a bunch of people that are randomly elected yeah. um but yeah if you want to keep your money to your heirs then you do what yeah so you you keep that the day you die that the the, the real estate is valued as of the date of death so wow. or six months after if whatever the, your executor chooses. So if it's worth a million dollars on your date of death, it gets revalued a million dollars and it goes down to your heirs. Now they have a million dollar property. If they sell it for a million dollars, they pay no tax. And they, if they want to keep it and depreciate it, all of a sudden now we're depreciating a property that's worth a million dollars. So you, you, you can get in the situation if you're above the annual, um, if you end up paying a state tax, which I think this year, it's indexed to inflation, so I don't always keep it, but it's $13 million per spouse. So if you're married and you're worth more than $26 million, you got problems. But if you're, you, you got good problems. You got good really problems. Really good problems. <laughs> really good problems. So, yeah. so if you, Something to strive for, Tamara, yeah. right? <laughs> so, but if you're, say you're worth $10 million. Yeah. You end up paying zero in estate tax, and all your real estate gets revalued at fair market value. So, so now your heirs get these properties; they can sell them, or they can keep them and rent them out and redepreciate them. And so, it is fantastic. the The other thing too that I didn't mention is if if a, one of the spouse dies, we have we're in a community property state. So, if your spouse dies, your property gets revalued then too. Oh. Um, for, for, for tax purposes, obviously, you know, we're not, we're not excited for, you know, uh, me or my spouse dying. I'm just saying, be careful, Abby. It's, you know, I need to get a life insurance policy on her. I need to evaluate my tax strategy and just look out. At t- just kidding. <laughs> yeah. You're like, oh, I don't want to pay tax on $950,000. Yeah. Boat accident. No, yeah. Saying, that was terrible, 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 terrible. Okay. All right. Oh, we went morbid on that. Um, but yeah. Well, does that change now? If someone has like, you know, as we talk about diversification of wealth and something and say, hey, I'm going to have a, you know, I can have a million dollar property or I could have a million bucks in my 401k. It, you know, not that we're all thinking about our now inheritance and our death planning here, but does that tax differently or is it still just all fall under that, that, um, like, is that's going to the kids? Does that have any? Yeah. So that has a, that, that's a big effect too. So 
real estate will get revalued as of the date of death. Money in a 401k will not. Um, so, so if you, so if you left, say there's two siblings and, yeah. and there's a, a million dollar 401k and a million dollar house. Yeah. Um, if, if it's a free, you know, you, you could take one or the other, you're going to take the real estate yeah. because on the 401k, when you take that money out, you're going to pay tax on all of it. Um, so the heirs, they, that it doesn't get a step up in basis. So it's, so basically that 401k is worth zero to them tax wise. So every dollar they take out, they pay tax on where that real estate gets revalued say at a million dollars, they can sell it the next day for a million bucks and it's all tax free. So that's, so that's, that's the great, that's the great thing with real estate. That's why our, like our, what's our plan? It's the buy, refi and die. die. And if you do those, you'll never end up paying um, you'll never end up having a capital gain from the sale of, of that real estate. Um, so I mean, I'm deal. sure we'll have plenty of financial investors cringing at some of my next statements here as far as like, get your 401k match, but don't, <laughs> I don't know, you know, that there's, there's, well, there's obviously tax strategy on tax deferment and all these different things like there. Um, but that's really interesting to think that your, your 401k, your retirement strategy, I, I, I would assume a lot of financial advisors, and, and you and I really aren't in that specific area of expertise, but a lot of them are probably saying, let's drain that money first as far as inheritance planning, right? Mm-hmm. Of like, just use your 401k so the kids aren't paying taxes later and give them the real estate, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I spoke with a, um, a financial planner with a client a few few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, and they were in that situation where they had more money in their 401k than they wanted. Um, and, and when they looked at it, they were like, okay, we got to stop. Um, we just, because we're going to pull our RMDs are going to be really high and we're going to have to pull that out. Your heirs are going to pay. So it's, it's one of those strategies. Everybody needs to look at, should they be doing Roth? Should they be doing, um, traditionals? Um, I like to diversify, um, I always put some money in some tax deferred accounts every year, but I don't, I'm not putting lots and lots of money in those. I, because my real estate can be tax deferred too through the strategy we've talked about. And then we have all the advantages that the real estate has when we die, when we hit retirement age. Um, and so, um, but, but we don't want to have all our eggs in one basket. You know, that's, 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 that's the flip side too. Sure. Sure. And then, uh, and I guess, um, well, and actually real quick, Tamara, do you have any tax questions? Not really. Okay. <laughs> I just, this has been awesome. This has been super, super awesome. And, and it's not the whole, like, uh, this would be like for clients, not like I have a friend <laughs> who did this terrible thing. No. So, well, and, and to get to it, and this is where kind of to bring this, well, I, couple things real quick. Is there anything else, generally speaking, that you're like, hey, people should know this right now or any other, like, you heard it from Kai right here as far as big picture tax ideas or real estate ideas? Um, I think we've talked about all the real estate ideas. The word, when you, when you started talking about 401ks, the worst thing I see when I talk to some people, um, maybe a year ago I was talking to a client and they put out, they've, they had a decent size um, 401k, they had some real estate, they had a good mix on everything. And the, the, the lady I was talking to, she, she was asking, well, I, I'm going to start pulling money out of my retirement account because I need to. Um, because once you hit a certain age, you have these required minimum distributions. You have sure, to take the sure. money out. And, and she was like, well, how much am I going to pay on that? I'm like, you're going to pay your regular rates. You're, you're probably going to be 24 to 32% every year. And she's like, are you kidding me? She's like, when I was 25 years old and I started putting money into my 401k, I was probably in the 10 or 12% tax bracket. And I put all this money into my 401k and now I've been super successful and now I'm paying double or triple rates. Um, and so it's one of those things. I always look at people putting money in retirement's great. Um, if you have a Roth and you're starting your career and you're in those low tax brackets, you probably should be doing the Roth versus the traditional. Yeah. Um, and when you're, when you get in your high earning years, maybe you need to flip and do the regular and not the Roth. Um, um, or maybe you need to do, do a little of both, but it's one of those things when you come to me and you're 65 and you're like, Hey, what's the best strategy here? 
is there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. Because you've already done it. But it's it's one of those things if you can diversify, you know, maybe do a little bit of in your 401k, at least get your your employer match. Um, maybe do Roth when you're in your early years when you're not earning a lot of money, maybe switch. Um, and then with that excess money, put it in real estate or put it in something that you're familiar with. I mean, if you're if you have no clue what's going on in real estate, you've never really done good. Probably, you know, it, it's, I wouldn't say take the plunge just because, you know, there's great tax benefits. Yeah, so. no, and that's where I always tell people the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. And that's part of my passion for real estate is I know, I've been working here for a while and I know Flagstaff real estate, right? Um, not only market values, but unfortunately I've learned way too much about the bones of houses, mm-hmm. uh, which I know you get into as well. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd rather you know, redo the plumbing on a house, then read a prospectus or whatever they call those things. Prospectus. Yeah. Prospectus that you get sent on like, here's what this fund is now doing. And I'm like, I don't. Like some people love that stuff. Some mm-hmm. people guru out on that, but I don't. And I guess kind of to wrap things up then, I think that leads uh, kind of in the, and I, this is a tricky one to set up as I'm thinking about how to exactly say this is, you know, I'd say in my profession that there's a fair amount of people, and I think especially right now just because of so many different market shifts and things and, and on top of people just being very, very financially aware with high inflation and economic concerns and in general, people are kind of self-selecting or assuming a lot of things, right? They're nervous to have conversations. They're nervous to call and see, well, could we actually buy that house? Could we actually afford it? And my guess is the same thing happens that you, you see a ton of people – once a year, mm-hmm. right? And and then just like that 65 year old, you know, 12 months can still be a big difference where it's like, I had you come in and email me or ping me or, you know, however they need to connect with Kai, that there is a probably a pretty significant amount of people. And I put myself in that zone category. We'll talk offline here of like, they, they could have asked you ahead of time and maybe done some things or structured that could save them money. But, but they just kind of did things or looked online or talked to their husband's brother's cousin's uncle, right, and, yeah. and thought that that's like, oh, it worked there, but it should work here. I don't know. You know I say it's almost every podcast of statistics being made up on the spot. But what percentage of people do you think are talking to you that one time a year and probably could have saved money if they had connected, even if it was ever so briefly, prior to now it's tax time? Oh, so – for someone who had a significant transaction in during the year, yeah, probably half of them could save money if they caught, you know, talked to their tax professional before. I've had people, well, I'm, I want to buy this property, and I just had this company that I've had for years, and I decided to put the real estate in this. And I'm like, hey, that's a corporation. That's the, the biggest mistake you, you could have ever made. And they're like, darn. And I'm like, you could have called me up. Um, and we could have saved you, you know, you, you, you could have a hundred, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, you know, problem that you just created right here. So yeah, you always want to talk to someone, a professional before, um, it's too late, but, um, you know, and, and don't, I have people that call me up. I have my properties closing today. I was thinking, (laughs) you know, about doing a 1031 exchange. How does that work? And I'm like, well, you, uh, you probably should have talked to, called me up about 30 days before because once you get that check, you can't do it. So um, it's one of those things when you're, when you're thinking about selling or you, you're, you got an offer or you're making an offer, just give, you know, give your professional a call and uh, they, can, they can steer you through what's going to be most advantageous for your situation because um, everybody's different. Yep. And I'd add to that and, and just in closing that there is good, better, best with everything. Right. And a lot of people, if you want to go online, that's good. It's better than nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. It's good to try and be educated. You want to call. We won't name any companies where it's like, hey, they jump into this profession for the two, three months a year to, to, to then work at it. Or there's the people like yourself that are in this day in, day out, it is your career, right? And it's, uh, can we call it a passion? Can tax be yeah. anyone's passion? No, no. <laughs> saving, saving taxes oh, and, uh, yeah. and planning um, is, is, is what I love to do. I love to, um, I have a client, I just met with them yesterday. Um, we sat down, we went through projections on some real estate that they were going to, they were going to build, um, we ran the numbers for three for the next three years to see how it would go, you know, go, go through all the costs to send it to their banker. 
Um, it was a big commercial property. Um, so sorry, we, you don't do commercial, no worries, stories, stories. but, uh, that's the stuff I love yeah, because, I love because you, you get in the front, um, before everything starts and you can see, you can avoid all those pitfalls. And then, you know, if everything goes out for this goes correctly, this, this is going to be a multi-million dollar property that, um, is going to be a fantastic investment for this person and it's probably his family for years to come. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you definitely want to give us a call on the front side because you're going to, you know, a lot of people are, ah, I don't want to pay 180 bucks or whatever to sit down and talk with Kai. And you're like, you know, you could save a couple hundred thousand dollars down the road. And so it's definitely worth it. Yep. Well, I love it. I love it. Well, thanks Kai for being on here today. We, uh, we'll put his information in the links below and, uh, Yeah, everyone be safe out there.